Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Bruce Shankle, uh, and uh, the, the document that you're looking at probably says Jacob Adoin is going to be speaking today. This is Jacob. Um, he's going to be driving the computer for me, and I'm going to be speaking. I work at BA3. Um, BA3 is a technology company that specializes in high-performance rendering on mobile platforms and desktop. And uh, we got our start in actually in aviation. Uh, we, we built the world's first synthetic vision system for the iOS platform. Um, and it's now part of the WingX uh, product for aviation. And so we also hail from a background of high performance graphics and operating systems and video cards. So we know a thing or two about graphics. Next slide. After we got into the aviation industry, we realized that those guys sorely needed some higher performance technology than what they were using. And so we started working on something that we call the Altus mapping engine. And you see here um, a few demos. This is on the iOS platform. Uh, this week, we're showing it off on Android at our booth. So it's a portable, high-performance rendering system for desktop, uh, Android, and iOS. And there's a product that launched this year on top of our technology called ForeFlight. They changed their whole mapping system to use our tech, and we're real happy with it. And you'll see some of the data that they use actually comes from OpenStreetMap. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, after we shipped Altus, what we did with OpenStreetMap. So let's continue. Um, so one of the things we're, we're, where we're coming from, just to sort of set some context for you, is we're coming to the OSM world from aviation, where you know, data is extremely critical for navigation. It's used in search and rescue, hazard avoidance, weather. Um, and you know, sometimes lives depend on these things. And so accuracy is extremely important. We recently, uh, we, we came to this last year and we showed you guys some OSM data that wasn't really ready for prime time. And we picked it back up and we've been, we've been working on a, a new pipeline for about five months now. And we're going to start, what we're working towards is treating OSM data as a first class citizen in our Altus mapping engine. And so what we're here to talk about, and you've heard a couple of talks today about uh, vector data. And there, you've seen a couple of examples of vector pipelines. Uh, we saw one from Steve. It was uh, based on GeoJSON, and we saw the s some g the guys from uh, Mapbox show their their approach to vectors. And what what we're going to show you is a pure vector pathway. And what we're going to do there is we're going to go directly from the OSM source data through a pipeline all the way to a client renderer without turning it into raster tiles and applying styles along the way. So let's get started with that. We we um. You've already heard a few talks today about why vector is interesting. Sometimes it's smaller data size. It depends. For example, if you're going to have multiple raster maps, you would have a lot more data than if you had a single vector map with different styles. Um, in some cases, it's very compressible. You can do on-the-fly styling and dynamic label placement. And there's some interesting scenarios that you can unlock when you have all of the vector data on board a device. Next. OK. Um, so we, we sort of look at the vector pipelines as in several different scenarios. There's end-to-end, -end, which I just mentioned. There's a partial, and there's a hybrid model that we see. Um, so the end-to-end -end is where you actually potentially will start with the actual source data, you know, get it into a database, uh, do some, use some tools to style it, maybe output it to some portable or compressed format, and render it on a device. Um, a partial pipeline might be you take vector tiles that you've seen someone else produce in their pipeline, apply styles to it, and then put it in another format for the device. Or you go directly, and I think Steve showed this earlier, you're going directly from GeoJSON to a rendering platform. And then there's sort of what we consider a hybrid model where you're, you're taking OSM data, running it through one of those previous pipelines, but maybe also adding some non-OSM data to it. For example, if you uh, have an Esri product, or you might be familiar with shapefiles, or if you have your own custom data, you can inject that into the system. So uh, we're going to, next. All right, so um, what we've seen so far today is we've seen some talk about getting OpenStreetMap data and importing it. And we've heard that this is a hard problem. We've, we would tend to agree with that. You, you need to have some expertise with uh, database systems. How many of you know about Postgres? Okay, a few. And PostGIS. All right, so there you go. 
the you know downloading the OSM raw data is like 22 to 23 gigabytes. It expands to a huge size, and it takes sometimes days to get imported onto a server. So this is not really a trivial problem. We actually are going to show today. Um, we have a database server running on this laptop with a subset of the OSM data. We're not going to get too much into that part. Next. Um, all right, so what we are going to talk about, though, is now that we have that data in the database, some styling that we can do with that. And we're going to switch over to um, one of our tools, um, and we call this Map Shop, uh, sort of like Photoshop, I guess. Again, this is a sort of a prototype tool that we're working on. And what this tool is doing is it's connected directly to a database, a, a Postgres database running on the machine, and we have a way of conveying styles and getting uh, having it directly query data from that PostGIS database. So if you'll bring up the, this, the first map here, what it's doing now is it's making queries uh, to a PostGIS database. It's bringing back data. It's sending it to the Altus rendering engine, and it's you know, creating the, the graphics that you see here. So we, this is, uh, I believe, Houston, Texas. All right, so Somebody mentioned earlier that styling of these things is sort of complex. It is, because you want to have, you know, per level uh, details. Like, so if you're looking at something from a really high altitude, you might only want to see the major roads. But as you zoom in, you want to, you want to bring in other data and style it differently. So over here, this, this complicated area that you see here is conveying features and styling information at their different zoom levels. So I'll ask Jacob to, let's change the style of something to maybe a different color. Looks like he's going to take a road and change it from orangish to greenish. There we go. So you would, again, this, this tool is not really ready for public use yet. But there's really no avoiding the work that you would have to do to sort of look at your map, bring in data at different levels, decide on a style to apply to it, and, and get a sense of how that's going to work in, for your end user. Um, th this is a completely different style with the same backing data. One of the things you'll notice is that there seems to be a little latency here when we're querying that data. That's because it's going to a, a database and doing a, a lot of queries, bringing it in. It's tessellating that raw data to stuff for the video card and, and uh, shading it on the fly. All right, so let's go back to the slide deck. So we were, we were talking about styling. The uh, next step we would we do in a pipeline like this is now that we have our styles, we've got our vector data and an interesting, uh, you know, the map looking in a, a way that would be interesting for our use case, we would export that data. And this map shop system that you see here actually has an export system built into it. We call it ME tool. It's actually part of our pipeline that's available on our website. And we would export that data to a com highly compressed map file. One of the things that we do is we don't use Geo GeoJSON, and we're not using any of the current f uh, vector formats that you've heard talked about today. We sort of came up with our own take on that. But it's a binary encoding of the vector data, and it's highly compressible. And we use a localized coordinate system in each of our vector tiles. We'll be happy to answer questions about that later. And then you can take that uh, stylized data and you can bring it down to a local device. And we've, uh, I'm happy to show this to you guys. We have like an Android, uh, iOS, and uh, uh, iPhone platform rendering these vector maps. Next. OK. so. One of the, one of the, so why would you want to do all this? We, we've, we've seen in the past that raster tiles are widespread, and they're very easy to use. Um, and they don't require a lot of, of computation on the device. But if you go to Vector, you can do some interesting restyling on the fly, and it opens up some, some things for like, uh, new scenarios like private routing. We have, we've had people approach us where they have custom data sets private roads into utility systems that are not, you know, part of public do domain. And they want to be able to put this data on their devices and do routing. So it opens up scenarios like that. And it opens up a, a lot of, um, a lot more 
customize interactions with the data. Once you have it in a vector format on your local device, you, for example, if you're going on a bike ride, you could tap on your bike route and have it restyled to show you where you're going without having to download more data or more raster tiles. We see a, a, a huge uh, potential for this, and I think we'll all agree that this, this year is sort of the year of the vector data set, and we're going to see a lot of uptake in vertical markets for this, like aviation. Um, so where are we going with this? Um, one of the things that we'd like to do is now that we've gotten quite a bit of experience with the OSM data source and some tools, we would like to begin importing more vector data sources. Um, this includes like publicly available and non-publicly available data. We want to be doing real-time dy uh, dynamic vector maps on devices. And we want to be, start levering some of the existing technologies. We're really excited about some of the things we've learned today about what other guys are doing. And we're, we're, we're excited to try some of those things ourselves. So once you've taken this uh, map, OK, so what Jacob's showing you now is we've taken and generated one of these uh, binary formats of the vector data. And, it, and we're rendering that, not querying the database. And he's going to apply some new style to it. Now, again, I do want to talk about what you're seeing here. This is all being uh, rendered on, on this machine. It's not downloading tiles from the internet. It's, it's all coming from this. A uh, local map file that's generated by the the export of the um, data from the database to this custom format. I, did we did we skip a slide? I'm not sure. No. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to 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 thank the uh, OpenStreetMap contributors. Uh, there's a huge amount of data in this system, and we're very thankful that you guys continue to put effort into that. It's quite amazing. We'd also like to thank the Postgres and PostGIS teams. If you want to learn more about this technology, we have a booth downstairs. We'd love to show you a demo and talk about where we're headed with it. Uh, are there any questions? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, um, would it be okay if I, the question is, uh, give me some use cases where vector data would be significant over raster data. Okay, a really good use case is something where you, you have a high frequency of update. Um, for example, if you're, if you're a, a pilot, we have a lot of familiarity with the, the aviation space. They have something called uh, SIGMETs and TFRs. These are temporary flight restrictions. If the president gets on Air Force One and flies to Charlotte, there's a new restriction that just popped up immediately. To get that data out to, to the, all the pilots is now something that can be done in a few minutes because a little bit of uh, vector data goes down and it gets styled on the device. A time signature can be attached to it. And so pilots who are flying in the area who are no longer on the internet see that style come and potentially go when that, time, when that window's passed. So it's extremely dynamic. And that's just one use case. Um, Jacob, would you like to contribute there? Um, we talk about uh, vector tiles being like um, less data or equivalent data to like a raster tile, but oh, sorry, we talk about vector tiles being less data or sometimes equivalent to. But I mean, in reality, like really, w when we're talking about equivalent, we're talking about like a single tile that maybe has like a ton of data in it, um, and like that single tile actually has data that you're going to use at other levels also, right? And so I don't think the, some of the um, accounting um, you know, has been really shown off like exactly like what the savings are. Um, but I mean, just imagine the, I mean, imagine if you could uh, just take the source Postgres database in a compressed form versus the most compressed uh, you know, raster tile set that you've seen. I mean, that's just one rough comparison. Things get bloated a little bit for creating those levels of detail, but um, I mean, it really depends on how you're creating the level of detail and sort of what you're storing along the way. Like uh, Dane was talking about storing a slightly higher res than they needed at a certain level to skip another level. I mean, that's, that's totally valid. I mean, you could feather that through your levels, right? Um, 
Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, I understand the question. The question is, do we support incremental update? So our, one of the things I want to make clear here is that our rendering system is different than the data production system. So you saw uh, GeoJSON today in Steve's demo with Whirly, Whirly Globe rendering GeoJSON uh, tiles. Um, and now Mapbox has announced they're going to have vector tiles available. Those could easily be consumed, and those are updated dynamically. So there's, there's not a, a strong, I mean, if you are putting something on a device and a person goes offline, of course, it's going to have to, it's gonna, you're going to have to use that until they get back online and can get updates for it. So we, we haven't really done any incremental updates with like the database or vector tiles. We, we've hosted very small like local ones for aviation. Normally they want them on board and normally they only care about high scales. This is our like first attempt into the um, like, you know, past like Z equals 10, for example. Um, but also what he was talking about is something like a vector uh, tile provider where we would request a tile and then you would provide vector data. Um, so if you want to uh, parse GeoJSON and send lines and polys and styles down to our mapping engine can. And I should point out that the, the styles are like um, independent. So if I had a slider where I could like change the color or animate, I could move a layer around or, you know, you want to do some like animation or some interaction you know, that happens instantly. We're rendering it every frame. We're, n we're not um, rasterizing it into a cached raster tile, even in video memory. It's basically just the frame buffer. Any other questions? Yes. Do our styles support transparency? Do our styles support transparency? Uh, I'm pretty sure they do. There's an alpha channel. This is a RGBA. Yeah. But when we scaled it down for the projector, like things, things look totally different up there. Yeah. All right. So the question is, can we set can we set an alpha value on one of these roads or polygons? Yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure what scale. So we don't print it out. So we don't have a very good UI yet. Um, but I mean, really, this is just an example that we use to work with the data. Like, if we can use something like tile mill to output, you know, vector tiles. There you go. There's some see-through roads. So this is an example of like making the inside of the road see-through, like, um, which is interesting in itself. But some of the casing problems, and I mean, there's like a ton of OpenStreetMap stuff that we dived into that, like, I mean, you can just see the styling doesn't take into account a lot, a lot of stuff. And going to some of the talks earlier today, I mean, we realized like how complicated, like, ridiculous, like, um, edge cases. There's so many. And this is like me in the last few days making this, you know like 60 line style file for like a few different styles. Any other questions? Well, I, I just wanted to thank uh, the organizer for letting us come and speak and we're happy to be here and we think highly of this community and we're glad to be a part of it. Thank you very much.